Wow, that was awesome. I, uh, I remember when I first read Ready Player One, I, I read it very early uh, when it came out, I immediately handed it out to every executive in my company and I asked them to read it. It was so profound. There is a magic combination in the book and the story for me of amazing characters, characters who are both intelligent and vulnerable and reach for what they believe in, and an epic battle of the individual versus group think. An, an amazing vision for the future, it's just crazy, and this love affair with 80s pop culture. It, it's this magic combination oh, that, thank you so much. that comes through together. Uh, the book is so versatile, and the story, um, it goes from Silicon Valley boardrooms all the way down to school lit clubs where eighth graders are falling in love. It has an am amazing spread. And um, recently, last night at the screening, it was, it was amazing. I didn't get to see it, but uh, I want to read some of the things that people were saying. Uh, the excitement was palpable. Uh, audiences were lined up for six hours. Quote, it's perhaps the greatest movie ever made. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> and this one that I love, what a fantastic love letter to games and pop culture. So it's just so honored to be here interviewing. Oh, you. Thank you so much. Well, yeah. I'm, it's an honor for me to be here. I've been coming to South by Southwest uh, for 20 years, I've seen a lot of film uh, premieres and attended a lot of panels here, and I always, in the back of my mind, dreamed of getting to do it myself uh, someday, but never at this uh, level. So it's so great uh, to be here in Austin and uh, to get to celebrate this experience with you guys. For, for the maybe now hopefully less than 10% of the people in the audience who don't know the story, without a spoiler alert, in a few sentences, can you, in your own words, share what this, both the story, the book, and the movie is about? The story. Okay, well, I can do that. Um, uh, uh, and the, the well, what's beautiful, you know, about the 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 movie is that I really feel like it's the most faithful adaptation of the novel possible. You know, uh, uh, if anybody else, if the if the story had found its way to anybody else, I think it w it uh, would have been hard to pull off. And maybe the one person who could have pulled it off uh, um, uh, uh, ended up making it. And uh, so the, the story of the book and the story of the, the movie is the same story, and it's about an eccentric uh, video game uh, designer, maybe the greatest video game designer who has ever lived, named James Halliday. Um, and he creates a, a, a video game called The Oasis that starts out as a kind of an MMO and, and then evolves into the pervasive uh, virtual reality platform that everybody uses that kind of almost replaces the internet when people you know, in 2045, when people log onto the internet, they log on to the Oasis, which is a virtual space that kind of contains everything that the internet uh, contains now. Um, and uh, when he he dies uh, uh, at the opening of the story, he um, uh, reveals uh, in a message that he sends to everybody around the world uh, that he has uh, hidden uh, an Easter egg inside this sprawling virtual world of the Oasis. And the first person to find it will inherit his fortune and control of that uh, virtual world, which sets off this, uh, you know, uh, kind of scavenger hunt, treasure hunt inside the virtual world uh, between individuals and a lot of kids uh, uh, who are devoted to uh, uh, unlocking uh, these puzzles and also uh, large corporations that are uh, 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 willing to do anything because uh, uh, because of the, you know, uh, uh, economic factors at work. So that's my long-winded synopsis. That, that was so awesome. Thank you. It's, um, the, the, the love of 80s culture comes through so clearly in the movie. Uh, can you share just a little about what it was like when you were growing up and what your youth experience was like? Well, I, you know, I was born in 1972, uh, uh, which looking back to me seems like the, the perfect time uh, uh, for me to be born to end up writing this story. That was the year that Pong came out. You know, I was born the same year that coin-operated video games uh, uh, were created, and I was, uh, 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 and as such, I got to be part of the very first generation uh, to have video games. You know, that was not something that my parents had, um, and uh, and they were a little bit uh, frightened of this new technology. And and uh, it was kind of like iPads or screen time today. Parents, you know, were worried about with this new invention uh, of video games and all the hours that it would uh, uh, 
uh, suck up in my life, like what effect it would have on me, you know? And uh, uh, my parents, who have since passed away, they always used to say, you know, these video games are going to rot your brain, you know? You're never going to amount to anything if all you do is play video games. And I just wish they were still around so I could uh, tell them what actually happened um, <laughs> with my love of video games. It's pretty unlikely, you know? I wouldn't uh, have believed it either uh, back then. But, uh, you know, uh, so I was, uh, in, I was five years old when Star Wars came out uh, in 1977, uh, and that was, the, that was when I realized I was a geek. That was the first thing I ever geeked out about. It just, watching that movie shook me to my core, and I became obsessed with it, uh, you know? And all I did was eat, sleep, you know, dream Star Wars, uh, and my little brother too, and we uh, kind of spent the rest of our childhood, uh, it was the mythology of our youth, but, uh, and, and Star Wars led to uh, kind of open my eyes to the world of science fiction, and also Close Encounters of the Third Kind had a profound effect on me, and made me want to, uh, 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 made me really interested in the uh, uh, possibility of life on other planets, and, uh, but so, but the, uh, the really, um, so it was kind of a golden age, too, to grow up with the movies, you know, kind of the invention of the blockbuster happened uh, uh, in the late 70s with Jaws, and then, um, you know, throughout the 80s, it was just, you know, it was a golden age for movies uh, for kids, you know, um, movies like The Goonies or Back to the Future or War Games or Iron Eagle, movies where kids can do anything, you know, kids can accidentally almost start World War III and then prevent it, you know, kids can find a map to pirate treasure in their attic and save their town, you know, from uh, uh, evil developers, like I just, I grew up on movies like that and they're really empowering to grow up with movies that make you think like, wow, you know, I can, I can do anything and even when adults have given up on a problem, there's a chance that, you know, the kids, uh, can solve it. So it was a great time to grow up, and and uh, uh, and then I was also part of the first generation to have home video games. You know, we got a Atari 2600 uh, console in 1978, and uh, I was spot welded to that thing for the rest of my childhood, uh, just playing one game after another. And uh, one of the games um, uh, uh, that we had was Adventure uh, for the Atari 2600, uh, which was the very first game to to uh, have an Easter egg in it, and I. And I found that Easter egg uh, in the early 80s, uh, just because that was the very first virtual reality simulation that I had ever had. Uh, I came from a family of modest means who couldn't give me endless quarters at the arcade, so I would usually get to play two or three games and then just end up wandering around the arcade watching other kids play. So when we got the Atari and I could just play as many games of Space Invaders or Asteroids or Adventure as I wanted, then that was, became a huge part of my uh, life and fed my imagination, especially finding these early Easter eggs uh, in the video games, specifically Warren Robinette's, you know, and uh, I'm so excited for Warren to see this movie. I, since I met him on my book tour, and um, he has no idea, you know, that, uh, uh, well, he kind of has an inkling, but he doesn't know his name is mentioned three times and that his, you know, game plays such a big uh, uh, role in the movie. But, but finding that uh, Easter egg in Adventure when I was a kid, it had a profound effect on me because it was, you know, uh, Atari didn't give credit to his video game designers back then, and so uh, uh, games would ship out without any... Uh, credit to the one person who had created them, so that really made him angry, especially this game Adventure, which was groundbreaking. It was the first graphical RPG. It was the first game with, with a map that you could move around, and the first game with an avatar. You know, your avatar was a square, but it was an avatar, and you could pick up a sword and carry the sword into another part of the map and, and navigate labyrinths and slay a dragon, and oh my god, it was... It was that was profound for me, and so I, you know, I played this game endlessly. Even after I had solved it and could and could beat it, I would still just play it just to explore the mechanics of this virtual world because it was a it was a fully realized you know virtual place that I could go and visit and explore. And uh, and then when I you know uh, followed the clues, uh, and I you know I've since found out this happened independently to a lot of other kids who had that Atari game. There are certain clues that you can follow. Uh, uh, to find this this hidden item, uh, kind of a secret key, uh, uh, an invisible dot that takes you into this, uh, uh, lets you into this secret room where Warren Robinette had hidden his, na his name. And when I found that, like, oh, so this is the guy who created the game, and he left this here, you know, as a secret for me to find. And, uh, and that always stuck with me, and, and Atari never even knew about it. Atari found out it years later when fan mail started to come in describing it. So uh, it was just, uh, and he, I think, uh, uh, Warren told me he got the idea from the Beatles' White Album and backmasking. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so many good things come from the Beatles. Um, uh, but the, uh, so that, that experience was, uh, uh, ended up directly inspiring uh, Ready Player One. 
I, I like how you use the word uh, virtual reality to really be general, and I think it, it speaks to how you think so high level about things, and that referring to adventure as a virtual reality. Scenario. Well, it, it was I think that's really wonderful. Even though it was just two dimensional, like through that window of my television screen, there is a digitally created world that I have an avatar in that I could guide through it. And in 1978, you know, I had that in my living room uh, uh, in my little town in Ohio. It was uh, huge, and kind of my love of video games and my love of, of technology built from there. So, uh, and the other thing was the VCR. You know, uh, landed in the early '80s uh, and was like a nuclear bomb dropped on my uh, my life because suddenly I was not limited to the movies that uh, uh, played at my local theater or um, uh, would show up uh, edited on television. Now I had access to all these films from all around the world and stuff that would I never would have seen on television or in the the cinema, and I could watch these movies over and over again and analyze my favorite scenes from Star Wars and see how the film was edited and put together. And so, um, you know, and also part of the first generation to have a home computer, you know, have uh, to get a TRS-80 for, you know, my 12th birthday and to start to learn how to use BASIC and program my own games. Again, all these giant, you know, powerful tools and pieces of technology that were dropped in my lap when I was a, a kid. And my parents, you know, I think a lot of uh, parents at that time were afraid of all this new technology. It was so something completely foreign to them. But for, you know, my generation, it was our, uh, these were our toys and this was our childhood. And we were introduced to this digital world that we could control. And when you're a kid, you don't have much control over anything. But when you play a video game, you have total control and it's your, it's your world. So all those things, I think uh, that was, you know, that describes my childhood along with Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, every other kind of geeky endeavor you could imagine. Uh, you know, I had an uh, overactive imagination and eventually I found the other people who had an overactive imagination, you know, who we were called geeks back then, uh, uh, you know, or, or nerds. I've since now I like to use the term enthusiast. You know, I think a geek or a nerd is really just an enthusiast, somebody who's so enthusiastic about what they love. They have to share that enthusiasm. They have to cosplay, just wear it on their sleeve. And you know, I, I, I'm that kind of person. I've always loved people like that. And so those are the kind of characters that I wanted to uh, represent in my story. That's really awesome. And I was um, referring just very briefly to your Dungeon and Dragons ear. When I was, you know, back in my youth, we played it a lot. And we were a very small subset within our school, you know, that was playing it. And most people didn't get it. When you were playing it, were you Dungeon Master or player? Or I was a terrible Dungeon Master. I was a, a much better... Well, I wasn't a great player either. I was the player who was always causing trouble and mouthing off to the bad guys and getting a party attacked. And uh, uh, But it was, you know, uh, um, uh, for me, that was uh, also how I learned to tell stories, you know, uh, fantasy role-playing games. And it wasn't just Dungeons and Dragons, you know, where you could kind of... Uh, role play a character in a, a Tolkien-esque fantasy setting, there were also Star Wars role playing games and Star Trek role playing games and Star Frontiers and Space Master Champions where you could be superheroes, really anything that you could imagine. There was like a video, uh, a role playing game system uh, for that genre and my friends and I would play all of them and jump around from D&D &D to, um, you know, uh, Marvel superheroes and, uh, um, and that was, you know, that was virtual reality too before there were computers capable of, of doing it. Um, uh, you had to use pens and paper and polyhedral dice in your imagination and you're you know, gathering around the table with your friends, you would create this virtual uh, reality platform with your collective imaginations and then you know, tell a story. Um, and I think you know, that right there, um, I mean, it, it goes from Tolkien uh, to Gary Gygax, who created Dungeons and Dragons, trying to um, uh, uh, turn Tolkien into a game. And then the whole generation of video game designers like you, you know, who grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons, Richard Garriott, you know, uh, the very first, uh, you know, role-playing games like Ultima or Acalabeth, those were all early computer programmers' attempts to convert Dungeons and Dragons uh, um, to the computer. And you see that that's what EverQuest is, that's what World of Warcraft is, and, you know, uh, uh, and what I imagine the Oasis being. It's a natural progression uh, of creating, having computers, uh, you know, simulate reality uh, and we've gone from Pong, you know, and just in my lifespan, from Pong to, you know, Roblox and uh, uh, also um, just photorealistic video games where you can glance at a video game and not be sure if you're watching a movie or a football game or, you know, because it's, uh, and so we're just a few years away from being able to render completely photorealistic virtual reality on the fly. Like when Ready Player One, <laughs> Ready Player One, those, each frame of that took, 
giant server farms to render for you know days and days to get each you know but eventually our our computers get faster every year and eventually you know we'll be able to do that on the fly which is kind of imagining what the the oasis is uh, so moving on to the book and the story for all the aspiring authors out there i believe it's your first book <laughs> uh, amazing um <laughs> How, how did that happen? Uh, was it bubbling for a long time, all the way back from that Easter egg you first found? Um, or, or you, how yeah. long did it bubble? Well, it uh, it came through heartbreak and creative um, uh, <laughs> uh, destruction. I had uh, my first movie that ever... Got, I've had two movies made. Um, uh, the first one I wrote way back in 1998, and it was called Fanboys. And um, uh, uh, thank you, one person. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, I wrote that movie here in Austin in 1998, and that was going to be my Clerks, you know, or my El Mariachi, yeah. or my Slacker. You know, I was really inspired by those guys and the way that these guys who just wanted to make movies went and made it happen, you know, used the resources that they had and made a film and then took it to festivals. So I wanted to try to, to, try to do that, and Fanboys was going was gonna to be that. And it um, uh, didn't work out that way. You know, just the, the, the script, something about the idea of, of Star Wars fans... Um, uh, traveling across the country, you know, uh, uh, to break into Skywalker Ranch to see an early cut of Star Wars because one of their friends is dying and he's not going to live to see it. Since then, this has happened several times. Star, Star Wars fans have gotten to see Star Wars movies early, but this, you know, uh, came from just my own uh, love of Star Wars and my own fear that I wasn't going to live long enough to see Episode One because I had been waiting since 1983 for new Star Wars my entire adult life, from the time that I was 12 until the time I was like 28. I'd been waiting for new Star Wars. So it was like a new chapter of the Bible was coming out. And, um, uh, and I poured all my Star Wars prequel mania love into this uh, script and, uh, and then tried to start to, to make it as an indie movie. But the script got enough interest that it ended up getting optioned uh, by a young, uh, uh, a production, uh, a young producer. And his production company ended up um, partnering um, with another production company that was... Um, it, this is a sad story, fanboys, now, because it ended up uh, involving all the worst people in Hollywood. Uh, you know, Kevin Spacey was a producer on Fanboys. Harvey Weinstein was a producer on Fanboys. Um, and they really did everything they could to ruin the movie. Uh, it was always about uh, a, a kid who was dying and his friends, you know, banding together to do something noble for their dying friend. And once they started to test screen it, they uh, said, you know, this... Um, 40-Year-Old Virgin had just come out and become one of the highest grossing R-rated comedies of all time. So they looked at our little heartwarming Star Wars movie and said, these guys are kind of like 40-Year-Old Virgins. We can... Uh... So they tried to re-edit it and they, it's like, let's try to... They, they took the movie away and gave it to another director who didn't know who Boba Fett was. And then they um, uh, had him take out the whole dying friend plot line and, and um, made it so they were just a group of Star Wars fans going to break into Skywalker Ranch just because they wanted to early. It ripped the whole heart out of the movie. Like, everything they warn you that could happen when you make a movie in Hollywood, it all happened. Uh, and Fanboys sat on the shelf for a couple of years and then kind of got dumped in 12 cities. And I'm still, you know, when I look back at it, I'm still proud of it, you know, because it's an amazing thing that it got made. You know, it's the, it's the first big, you know, uh, Hollywood movie about uh, uh, Star Wars fandom or fandom in general and the way that uh, a shared love of pop culture can bond you together with your friends. Uh, uh, and so, um, it, you know, it's got Carrie Fisher in it, uh, William Shatner's in it, uh, uh, Lando, Billy D. Williams, uh, you know, and uh, I have a cameo in this movie. It's just un so impossible and unlikely that it would ever get made. I'm, you know, uh, I'm so proud of it, but it was also just soul crushing to have the movie uh, taken away and have, you know, the, the characters are all based on me and, and friends that I had grown up with and uh, have something so personal taken away from you and changed and altered you know, it made me question whether or not I wanted to be a screenwriter. I realized being a screenwriter, you have no control over your story or your characters. You hand it over to people who have the money to produce it. And for them, it's a product, you know, and they want to sell that product to as many people as possible and, many, and make it as, you know, broad and appealing to as many people as they can, which is not conducive to good art, you know, often. So that uh, was what inspired me to try to write a novel. I thought, you know, I'm never gonna be able to geek out <laughs> at the level that I want to and drill down into nerd culture, you know, uh, as deeply as I want to uh, in a mainstream Hollywood movie. But in fiction, you know, there's nothing between you and your audience and you can, uh, and you don't have to worry about budget or anything, you know, you, uh, writing a novel is like directing a movie on paper, you know, and you have an unlimited budget and all the best uh, actors and, you know, you cast all the roles and dress all the sets and, and, uh, 
and you know, so when I started writing Ready Player One, I, I assumed uh, right from the beginning it could never be a movie because of the way in which I wanted to uh, mash up all of pop culture together and celebrate all of pop culture. You know, in a, in a book you can do that. You can have any painting you want hanging on the wall and you can have any song you want playing on the radio. Uh, but when you do that in the movie, you're reproducing those things and you need to get permission. So I assumed, you know, well, well if I want to do this, it'll just never be a movie. So I, the whole time I was writing it, I assumed uh, it, was, it would never be a movie and that was really freeing to me. I just... Uh, set my imagination loose and told the story that I wanted and made it as geeky and nerdy and specific and weird and eccentric as I wanted just because it was my first novel and I wanted to see if I could write a novel and see what would happen, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't even sure you could get a book like this published, you know, when I finished it, I was like, can you have Vultureman fight Mechagodzilla and Voltron and not get sued by all those people, you know, um, it, I, uh, and it, you can, that's the magic of fictitious use, you know, uh, but I wasn't sure anybody else would want to read this story. I thought maybe a couple other weird, you know, uh, uh, nerdy guys my age, you know, might dig it and it might have a small cult following, but I never... Never in a million years imagined anything, you know, uh, that would happen. Uh, but in, in a 48-hour period, uh, there were, first there was a bidding war over the book rights to my weird book about, you know, Atari and Pac-Man and Duran Duran. And, uh, 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 and because of that interest, it led to a bidding war the very next day in Hollywood. They have film scouts that watch book auctions, and if there's a lot of interest in a book, they notify the film studio. So after this crazy day where my whole life had changed because I had sold the book to Random House, they said, oh, and by the way, now there's a a bidding war in Hollywood over, over, this, uh, over this book. And I'm like, well, do they know that it's unfilmable? Uh, like, do they know <laughs> you can't make this into a... But it ended up going to Warner Brothers, you know, the biggest movie studio in the world. And I was attached to write the screenplay because I was already in the Writers Guild because of fanboys. And so they, if they wanted to buy my book, they had to let me take the first crack at it. But the problem was I worked on my drafts of, uh, of the screenplay before... Uh, the book had even been published, so I could point to it being a bestseller yet, you know, or uh, much less an international bestseller. Um, uh, so I had a lot less leverage to kind of keep it true to the book. I couldn't say, you know, oh, my fans are going to hate this, you know, if we change this, because I didn't have any fans yet outside of people in the publishing world and some of my friends. So I, uh, uh, I kind of, you know, I bent over backwards to try to please them because it seemed, you know, so unlikely this movie would ever get made. And if it did get made, it would probably not resemble my book in a lot of ways. So I was, you know, I kind of resigned myself to that, you know, but I had my fingers crossed. The, the thing that I hoped for secretly, uh, and the analogy I'd always use, I, was, I would say, I hope something like Who Framed Roger Rabbit happens, uh, you know, uh, and that was, that, that happened because of Steven Spielberg. You know, he uh, was a producer on that movie and he went around to all the different animation companies and said, we want to make a movie that's like a tribute and an homage to the whole history of cartoons and animation and will you let us use your property in this movie? And everybody said yes because he's Steven Spielberg and they all wanted to uh, be involved. So that's how you have Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and, uh, 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 and Warner Brothers and Disney characters all in the same scene is because he made that happen and uh, uh, you know by some miracle you know uh, the uh, through the development process um, about three years ago the script found its way to him and he read the script and then he read the novel and then you know uh, he decided to make the movie the that's a wonderful uh, story of authenticity and in, in not trying to make a movie actually possibly help make the book larger than life which is wonderful the the characters in the book, uh, for me, personally at least, they're, they're very intelligent, they, they have strong beliefs, um, they're a little vulnerable because they, they don't all like the stuff everyone else likes. Was there inspiration for the, the characters in the books? Or? Yeah, well, you know, my, m me and my friends and, and uh, you know, I've, I've spent my whole life kind of going to comic book conventions, going to Gen Con, going to Dungeons and Dragons conventions. I've surrounded myself with, you know, uh, enthusiasts, you know, nerds and geeks and passionate uh, people. Uh, uh, and uh, there's something about that energy that I love because I have it too. You know, when you meet somebody who loves the same things that you do and you start to talk at a party, you know, there's this instant connection. You know, you can make a, if you make the right Monty Python reference, it conveys a whole world of meaning, you know, and a whole sense of understanding uh, to certain people, you know. And that was, that was kind of what I tried to capture in Fanboys, but even more in Ready Player One, I wanted to convey that sense of, of community and the way that 
culture can create community. You know, people will diss on pop culture, but I don't know what other culture, you know, we've grown up in. I, if you were born in the 70s, the only culture you've ever known is popular culture. And uh, what other culture are you going to reference? Unpopular culture? If you reference unpopular culture, uh, like obscure literary references, like are you trying to um, uh, reach a broader audience or convey to do, you know, uh, be better at telling your story? Or are you trying to narrow the audience or make your reader, you know, uh, uh, feel distant from the story? Like when I, when I see a character in a novel or a film who, uh, you know, has gone to see the same movie that I have or read the same book or um, uh, visited the same place, it uh, lets me know that I live and exist in the same world as that character. And so I wanted to try a, to write a, a, a book uh, uh, with with characters like that, and you know, who spoke in that kind of uh, pop culture shorthand that me and everybody that I you know uh, spend time with uh, uh, speaks in. I didn't make a list of references to squeeze into the story. I tried to include them organically, the way that you do in a conversation with your friends, where uh, you know a reference to something occurs to you, and you you know uh, weave it into the conversation, and and it helps you communicate with the people. You know, if they if they understand what you're referencing, then that's that's a really profound, deep way of communication that, uh, um, uh, uh, that is kind of unique uh, in, our, in our culture. So the, uh, the characters all kind of grew out of geek archetypes, you know, uh, or enthusiast archetypes of, uh, uh, of people that I know who are just passionate uh, about anything, you know, whatever it could be, Harry Potter, Star Trek, you know, uh, Funko Pops, whatever it is, you know, if you are passionate and, uh, and uh, you can go on the internet and find a community of people who are also really into that and share your love of it and, and whole communities form around the internet, uh, around any kind of fandom for a rock star or a movie or a television series. And, uh, uh, and I don't think there, you know, uh, anything that connects people and makes uh, them feel closer to each other is a good thing in my estimation. That's wonderful. Uh, so James Halliday, he's an interesting character, and he's he's maybe someone I've never met, or maybe none of us have ever met. Was there was there pieces that helped you imagine and create his character? Uh, yes. Well, a couple uh, uh, people. One of them is Austin's own Richard Garriott, uh, Lord British. Um, uh, Richard Garriott is a, a, was a Austin. He lives in New York now, I think, but he's an Austin uh, based. Uh, uh, you're not here, are you, Richard? Richard's not here. Richard was the, here last night. He got to see the movie last night. Uh, he sat in my row. I was really excited. But he he was uh, uh, helped create some of the very first role playing games, like a Calabeth and then Ultima, and uh, and Ultima eventually evolved into Ultima Online, which was the very first MMO, uh, run, you know, based here in Austin. And it was uh, kind of like Diablo. It was like a third person perspective MMO, but it was the first virtual world shared by hundreds or thousands of people. Uh, and that you know that led to EverQuest, which led to World of Warcraft, which led to all kind of modern uh, uh, MMOs. And Richard uh, uh, had his D&D character, Lord British, uh, that he also put into his video games. And then at press junkets and stuff, Richard would dress up as Lord British in serious like Ren Faire attire. And he had like his long Padawan braid and uh, his like uh, self-designed necklaces. He's a really eccentric character. And it did not always go over at these video game <laughs> junkets when, when he showed up as Lord British and he didn't care. Uh, and and I loved it. And he um, he would uh, open. He had a mansion outside of Austin, Britannia Manor, that was full of secret passages, secret passages in the swimming pool. Um, uh, and he would open up his house every year uh, and have um, uh, haunted houses where he would hire actors and jugglers and fire eaters and lead people through his house. In a uh, uh, did anybody ever go to this? Uh, any of these? Uh, no, this is a long time ago. He stopped doing it, but. Um, uh, this is, happened before I moved to Austin, but I heard tell of this, and I was like, wow, this guy's amazing. And eventually, he uh, saved up all his video game money and bought a ticket to go into, the, uh, into space on the International Space Station. So he was a real great example of what a, you know, uh, like a diehard Dungeons & Dragons geek with unlimited funds you know, could do, really anything that he could imagine. <laughs> You know, uh, I remember when he was showing me his house, he had a piece of the Great Wall of China. It's just, I stole that. I'm like, dude. Um, uh, and so it was kind of a, a when I pictured James Halliday, it was kind of half Richard Garriott and half Howard Hughes, um, uh, who was uh, another kind of eccentric, uh, uh, rich dude who locked himself away from the world and had a hard time. Uh, you know, maybe mildly autistic and had a hard time communicating with other people uh, and, and would, you know, uh, kind of sequester himself from the world, a little bit agoraphobic. So um, those, but also, you know, uh, uh, there were several, uh, there's a partnership also between James. What? 
there we go, it's between James Halliday and his partner, uh, Ogden Morrow, who's played by Simon Pegg in the movie. And that partnership was inspired by all these great uh, partnerships in the tech industry, like Jobs and Wozniak, or uh, um, John Carmack and John Romero, the guys here in Texas that made uh, Doom. There's always usually like, we were talking about this, there's usually like one guy who's good at PR and good at the public relations end of things, and the other guy who's like the super tech you know, was kind of guy who knows hardware and software and makes makes it all happen. But both are necessary to the success of you know uh, the endeavor. So I, uh, those things all kind of led to uh, uh, an inspired holiday. Thanks. There, there's a, a potentially a, besides the amazing story of the book and the movie. Someday there'll probably be a documentary of your life and and the creation of this and and the the amazing flow of events. Uh, one event that must be uh, powerful for you is when you heard that Steven Spielberg would be the person working on your movie. Do you do you remember where you were and uh, yeah. when well, you heard? Yeah, it was a, it was certain. Well, it was a it was like a three two and a half I think week long period of uncertainty. Where first they told me I mentioned this last night. First they told me, well, the, the, there's a new director who's interested, and the script is with him right now. And like they kept saying, there's this director, and I'm like, well, who is it? And they're like, it's Steven Spielberg. And um, <laughs> and you know, I was uh, I was kind of overjoyed. And then the more I thought about it, I'm like, oh, you know, there's no way he's going to do this. He's going to read it, and then he's going to read the book, and he's going to decide not to do it. Uh, and but now I'm going to have to spend the whole rest of my life imagining what it would have been like if Steven Spielberg <laughs> had made Ready Player One. Because who, you know, I love Christopher Nolan. You know, it would be great if Christopher Nolan made it, but. It's not Steven Spielberg, um, you know, uh, and that's why I tell people now, like, really, there's nowhere, like, I'm so lucky, you know, this is my first novel, and, you know, uh, uh, and my second movie, and there's really nowhere to go but down from here, you know, <laughs> the, um, you know, George Lucas isn't going to come out of retirement and uh, direct Armada, and James Cameron's making, our, you know, Avatar movies until the end of time, so I, you know... I already got to work with my one, you know, available uh, uh, filmmaking hero. And uh, so it's just never, you know, I'm just ready for the slow fade. Uh, <laughs> so for all of us who would fantasize about having this amazing story and then having it be translated to film with Steven Spielberg, are there any snippets of the process you can share with us? What's it like to work with Steven? What, do you, you know? Yeah. Um, it's the coolest thing ever. Um, you know, I think that uh, when everybody uh, going to meet him, you know, I just got a haircut and my wardrobe is overthought, and I'm realizing, and my uh, uh, my producing partner Dan Farah is uh, also uh, overthought his wardrobe, and we're all just nervous as hell. And I realize everybody who has met Steven Spielberg has felt this way for like the past 30 years. So, and this poor guy, everybody who meets him, you know, is just can hardly get any words out. And, uh, uh, and I think he's gotten used to that. And that's why he's just so good at, so, uh, at being so personal and genuine. And he immediately set, us, you know, set me at ease and made me, uh, 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 you know, started talking about my book. And uh, I'd already heard that he had started coming into these meetings at Warner Brothers with cop paperback copies, dog-eared copies of Ready Player One filled with post-it notes of things that he wanted to know why they weren't in the movie and wanted to make sure, like, if I'm going to do this movie, then all this stuff has to go back in, you know? Just the best thing. They were like, Ernie, it's a good thing you weren't there. You would have had a heart attack and dropped dead. And um, uh, and I would have, you know? It's good that it was a slow, gradual uh, uh, process. But he was just, he immediately set me at ease and immediately started making me feel like a collaborator. And we started talking about the movie and what we were going to do. And it was, you know, it was, uh, uh, like, getting to play action figures, you know, uh, when I was a kid with my brother, but getting to do it with Steven Spielberg and do it with all the, you know, the best toys uh, uh, and the best technology uh, in the world. I will tell, it, it, for people who haven't heard this story, that I, I was so looking forward to this, and, and we, we started talking about having the DeLorean uh, time machine in the movie, and he mentioned it, and I'm like, oh, by the way, and then I pulled out my glove box lid for my own DeLorean that I had brought uh, all the way from Texas. Uh, and I'm like, hey, you know, I hope it's okay. I brought a piece of my time machine. Uh, would you sign it? And he signed it uh, for me. Uh, uh, Dear Ernie, where we're going, we don't need roads. Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I'm like, oh, thank you. And then I, after he handed it to me, I said, hey, have you ever signed any piece of a DeLorean before? And he said, no, I have not. And I said, do you know who the only guy in the world with a Steven Spielberg signed DeLorean is? <laughs> this guy. And then I made him promise never to sign another one, so <laughs> I win. Wow. 
uh, from a from a technology standpoint, uh, you've got this story in your mind, and you've been working on it. And then at some point, you must have seen a first. 3D mock-up or a first snippet or a first capture of some part of of your creation. What what was that like? Was there a time when you saw that? Yeah. Well, before we started shooting, I saw previs uh, of the race uh, scene. How many of you guys got to see the movie last night? Uh, awesome. Thank you, guys. It was such a great audience, like the best audience ever. We had technical difficulties. It's like the best technical difficulties ever uh, because it, like, it was suddenly this horrible uh, uh, glitch in the sound and a pause, and it was just a long enough pause for people to turn to each other and freak out about how much fun they were having with the movie. It was, you know, it was uh, heart-wrenching heart <laughs> for us uh, who had made the movie, but uh, it ended up being okay. So I'm really grateful to everybody who was in the uh, audience last night. But the... Um, uh, the first time I saw uh, uh, anything was from our race sequence, you know, which is something that was not in the book, but had evolved, you know, uh, 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 through my collaboration in the development process. Because you can't in the book, there's a lot of uh, having people stand at an old classic arcade game and play a perfect game of Pac-Man or play through a whole, you know, a perfect game of Black Tiger, something like that. That is can work in a book. For some people, it works in a book, uh, but uh, it doesn't really work in a movie. It isn't cinematic and would stop the story. So we had to find set pieces that would replace uh, you know, the static uh, uh, things that happen in the book and make them more cinematic. And one of them is this kind of futuristic burnout Super Mario Kart of 2045 uh, virtual reality race where you could have any vehicle from any movie or any television show or, or that has ever existed uh, uh, and have a great race. So I got to see, you know, the um, uh, previs of that, which had my DeLorean in it. You know, I had, uh, when I bought my DeLorean, it was, uh, I, I did it because I knew I could use it in my author photo uh, on my book, and then I could take it around on my book tour, which would make it a business expense, um, uh, which it is the greatest business expense of all time. Uh, it's, 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 been in, it's been in the New York Times twice, and now it's been featured in a Steven Spielberg movie. So um, uh, all the people who told me I was wasting my money on this crappy Irish sports car from 1982, they're wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, so that was one. Of, that was the first previous I got to see was with you know Ecto 88 with you know my crazy mashup uh, DeLorean with the kit scanner from Knight Rider going through this amazing race that had Mad Max's Interceptor and the Mach 5 from Speed Racer. Like I said, it's like playing action figures but with Steven Spielberg. It was the uh, most fun, you know. Uh, and so, uh, but then the even more profound thing was going to visit the set uh, in Leaveston Studios in London. I got to go, uh, you know, uh, three different times, you know, and I could have gone more. That was the best thing after my first. First visit. Steve was like, "Come back anytime." You know, you can. Uh, 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 he he told me that having having me around, you know, uh, helped keep his energy up and boost his enthusiasm because I was just geeking out about everything that was happening. And that's the secret about Steven Spielberg is he's a huge geek too. You know, he um, uh, uh, the guy knows. You know, usually I'm the one, you know, being a nerd and correcting people about movie trivia, but he was correcting me nonstop. You know, about little things that I would get wrong, even about his. You know, uh, there were often trivia challenges about who knew more about Steven's career, me or Steven. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it was uh, uh, it, it was it was just a great experience. But yeah, when I went and visited the sets in Leavesden, they had constructed the stacks. You know, they're not as big as they were uh, in the movie. They've been digitally kind of copied and extended, but they had built you know seven or eight of them in a whole working city. And this was something that I had imagined, you know, just in my head. And then I had seen it illustrated in, you know, on the paperback cover and in lots of fan art. But uh, uh, but seeing it actually built, you know, engineers had to figure out how to build this thing uh, for real, you know, kind of this Blade Runner trailer park. Uh, um, and uh, it was like walking into the, you know, paperback cover of my novel and seeing this thing that only existed in my head built for real and realized, you know, uh, as an actual structure that now was popular with extras. Uh, and it was, you know, just everywhere I looked, you know, my book was coming to life and little details of my book. And even in, I would go to the costume department and they had copies of my book. I would go to the, you know, different like uh, uh, art departments and they were, you know, the characters' costumes, so much stuff that never made it into the script. Uh, but made it into the movie came right from the book because Stephen had everybody, you know, using the book as like a, a source text for dressing sets and costumes and everything. It was just, I tell everybody, you know, everything that you could ever want to happen when you write your first novel has happened to me. And so, all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, really incredible. When when you saw the whole movie, uh, maybe for me, I'm not in the movie business. I don't know if it, it's a gradual process. You see the movie at 60, 70, 80, 90, or 100 percent, or is there one day when you just see the whole movie all all together and, and 
you know. Yeah. Well, I you know I saw I saw little pieces in previs, and then I saw stuff filmed. But once uh, we went into post production, Stephen kind of goes into his bubble and didn't want. Uh, he wanted to assemble the movie, and he wanted to he wanted to get my honest reaction, so he wasn't showing it to me in in pieces. And he and you know he and uh, Michael Kahn, uh, who's edited you know almost all his movies all the way back to Close Encounters, they went off and uh, 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 and assembled you know a uh, uh, first cut, and and that was when I finally got to see it. But it was almost you know there's just a few little changes from that. Like he he waited until he was ready, and there were you know. The, uh, he took his time, you know, there were people like, when are we gonna get to see this movie? And I was like, this guy has earned uh, the right to take as much time as he wants, uh, as he needs, and Warner Brothers, you know, uh, uh, agreed, and uh, the proof is in the pudding, you know, it was, uh, it was amazing. And I can see why they do test screenings now, you know, if you work on something for years and years, and, and uh, you know, you love it, and it seems fantastic to you, but you don't know how, you know, the average person who has no relationship with the book, you know, uh, uh, or, or the story, how they're going to react, which is why last night was, you know, so special for me and for all of us involved with the movie. It was our first time, you know, uh, showing it to an audience of people who weren't, you know, related to the press or, or the media, just regular people who love movies. And, and so that was the moment we were waiting for. Uh, for, for me, in, in reading the book, the, your ability to paint a vision Flow, seems to flow very, very effortlessly. It just, it's all right out there and it's so clear and it's uh, so wonderful. And um, I, was, I was making a note that in, in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of amazing visionary CEOs and companies, but your painting of the future was especially, you know, beautiful and poignant. Um, there, there's a big um, kind of theme in the book, I think, just about escapism and people needing to balance their real life with just some entertainment and, and you know, ability to be free and relax and go into their own spot. Can you speak to that a bit? And well, um, uh, yeah, you know, I think that's people, people ruminate about the meaning of life. Uh, and uh, I don't, uh, uh, for me, I think it's having something to look forward to. Uh, and so much of what I look forward to is more art, you know, from the people that I love. Um, the, you know, uh, it makes me think of this uh, Dead Poet Society, one of my favorite movies. And in that movie, Robin Williams says, you know, uh, uh, business and banking and uh, economics and medicine, these are all noble pursuits. But uh, art and music and poetry and cinema, those, that's what we stay alive for, you know. Um, and art is really just... Uh, you know, one person or a group of people, their their expression of like taking the you know the burden of human existence and the experience of being human in this time and this place, and and expressing that and expressing the the frustration of that and the joy of that and the you know sadness and the the promise, all of that you know in a piece of art, in a painting, in a film, in a song, you know, like some facet of human experience. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's all of us human beings doing that for each other, you know, trying to take our, uh, uh, certain point of view, uh, and then share it with others and, and hopefully let them know, you know, for me, the best art lets you know that you're not alone. Like, oh, you know, I felt that way too, or, uh, uh you know, I had that experience too, or I, you know, I love that too, or that meant a lot to me too. Those, that human connection, you know, uh, it, for me is, you know, the, one of the best parts of life and and art you know uh is the the most important pursuit you know the these are these are dark times my friends uh that we are in now and i feel like art and expressing uh uh expressing that in your art and and using art as a weapon uh uh to um to deal with that is uh more important now than than ever for me In your unofficial parallel role as a futurist, which I feel you are, um, I'm curious if uh, when, you know, has that been with you your whole life or as part of putting together Ready Player One, did it, you know, allow you to think a lot about the future? Uh, um, that's an interesting question. I, you know, well, it, come, it came from my love of science fiction and starting with my love of Star Wars, but that led to my love of, of Heinlein and especially the Heinlein 
uh, juveniles like Red Planet and Have Spacesuit World Travel. I just read all those and loved them, and that you know led to uh, uh, me exploring the whole you know uh, uh, all the great classics of science fiction. I love uh, Alfred Bester. Uh, and then that led me to uh, discovering William Gibson, Neuromancer, you know, Rock My World. And then uh, uh, the two novels I credit most with inspiring Ready Player One are Neuromancer and then Snow Crash was profound for me. And I'm so, I heard Netflix might be making Snow Crash, which makes me so excited. It's one of my, still one of my favorite novels. I, I tried to articulate this to, to Neil Stevenson, but then I got tongue tied. You know, I always, uh, uh, I, whenever I do a book signing or have people line up to me, I'm very conscious of what it feels like to be on the other side of that because I still you know like when I met Steven or when I meet someone like Neil Stevenson I just revert back to my you know teenage geek self and I can't you know get a sentence out or express uh, so I usually I try to say what I wanted to say to Neil Stevenson in interviews so hopefully he'll hear it because I I don't I think I just spoke gibberish when I was uh, w when I met him but the um, uh, but yeah so it was science fiction and then growing up with Star Trek uh, as well just I had always um, uh, been drawn to stories of the future and an imagined future. And for me, I love what, what I love about technology is how, or what I love about uh, science fiction is that it examines technology um, from a human perspective. Like how does it, the advent of this new technology uh, uh, affect us as human beings in the way that we interact with each other? Um, uh, that's what's really uh, frightening and scary about our technology you know, is it can get out of hand, you know, it's a tool, uh, maybe our most powerful tool, but it doesn't always behave the way that we want it to. That's, you know, uh, uh, one of the themes of 2001, uh, one of my favorite movies, like HAL 9000, it, this, this AI is, uh, is a tool, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it gets out of control. We entrust our lives to these tools, but then, it, you know, and I think of that uh, like the internet, you know, the internet has drastic, like in, within, two decades drastically changed our culture, you know, from the mid nineties when it went to, you know, something very few people heard of, or they had signed up for an email account, at the library, you know, in 1996 to cut to 20 years later. Uh, and it's, we are all tethered to the internet every second of every day through a portable computer that we carry in our pocket. So the, the Oasis already exists. You never wonder about the name of an actor or an obscure fact, you know, you have instant access to the entire collected knowledge of the human, species, you know, uh, at your fingertips. Any video, song, anything that can be digitized, you have instant access to it. And that has changed our culture and the way we interact with each other in profound uh, ways. And also, you know, allowed, it created this whole new kind of um, a human relationship where you can meet someone uh, on the internet, develop a really strong bond, friendship with them, or fall in love and never even be on the same continent. You know, it's, a, it, I mean, there were pen pals before, but it was never like, you know, people falling in love inside of World of Warcraft, you know, or, uh, or meeting online and, and existing kind of just as pure, raw uh, consciousness and communicating through this filter of the internet with all the phys physicality removed. Uh, and then, the, you know, people would fly to another country, or another state to meet this person. And sometimes the relationship works in the real world and sometimes it doesn't because sometimes the filter is necessary for the relationship. So I'm, I was, I've always been fascinated by that. And that's, you know, our technology keeps, like our, our technology internet has changed politics. It's changed the global, you know, political climate. And, and uh, it's just, you know, I don't know, sometimes I feel like we're in the darkest 80s timeline, you know, like Gordon Gecko is president and um, there are Russian computer hackers and I'm hoping that Matthew Broderick is uh, gonna save us. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I don't know, future, the, the, imagining the future is always dangerous, you know, because you're always wrong. And the more detail you go into, the wronger, you know, the, the more incorrect you are. It's like flying cars in Back to the Future 2 or Blade Runner, you know, where are flying cars? Um, uh, whenever you, you know, um, uh, so it's, it's really tricky. So I don't know, I, I, I imagine the future, but I don't know how correct those uh, predictions will be. Okay, I think, we, I think we have time for one more question. Let me know, guys, if we, how much time we have. Uh, no more time? Okay. okay. Time to throw a trailer in Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. First off, I just want to say I'm a huge fan, and my whole company is built around creating a prosperous oasis or metaverse. Um, I was really taken aback by the distribution strategy for this film. Uh, the experiences are exclusive to platforms that are expensive and centralized and don't respect privacy. This seems completely at odds with your, the sentiment of your book. There are virtual arcades with classic games built off the CODA emulators on the Internet Archive. 
There is emerging technology and tools that would allow for a free and open oasis. And from where, I stand, from where I'm standing, it seems like you've joined the IOI. Oh. <laughs> can, you tell, can you please explain your position on centralization specific to the current landscape of VR? Jeez. Um, <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure all the virtual reality uh, simulations that we've made are free uh, for anybody to download. And I know that the Sansar, uh, the very first one that we put out, H's Garage, was available through Sansar, and you don't even need virtual reality headset. Anybody with a laptop or an iPad can access that and explore H's Garage. We recreated the set of um, one of the, like a hangar with a lot of different ships, one of the sets of the movie. Uh, we took all the assets uh, from ILM and uh, recreated it in Sansar, and you can go and uh, check that out uh, for free. And it's crazy, because I went and visited this um, in VR um, uh, when I was on the set, because everything, all the assets had been uh, uh, rendered in such a way that Steven could look at them in VR. Um, uh, and I could put on a VR headset when I was on the motion capture stage and see the Oasis rendered around me in real time. Uh, uh, live and it was uh, 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 so I felt like I got to visit the locations of the Oasis on location when we were shooting the movie and then when we made this VR experience uh, they did an amazing job of rendering it uh, at the same level that it is in the movie so you can go and visit it for free uh, and uh, and check it out you don't need VR uh, goggles and the other uh, stuff that we have coming out over Steam um, is different video games virtual reality experiences that are all just free promotional uh, Stuff. So I think if we were charging them or making people uh, pay, I don't know. It doesn't doesn't feel. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't feel think like that value is no longer money though. It's data, right? Because you have companies that don't make any money anymore. They they sell data, and so we're kind of moving into this time where you're putting things onto platforms that will have eye tracking and be able to look into our future decision making. So I just was wondering more specific to the infrastructure of your thoughts right now with what's happening with virtual reality and how you can combat that, or if you see that as the IOI or you see it as the OASIS? Well, I mean, the, um, uh, I mean that's hard to say. Any, any video game or any uh, simulation is something that, you know, is a revenue generator and has to be built to make money. Uh, and, you know, we don't, uh, it would be nice if everything were free and, and open access, but I know that every, you know, there are, um, you can try out virtual reality in public libraries now, like schools. Like we used to have computer rooms full of TRS-80s in, uh, in the 80s, but now there are computer rooms where I visited so many high schools that uh, uh, have virtual reality rooms now, and kids can download and try out uh, virtual reality experiences and go on virtual field trips. They'll all go like stuff that's imagined in the book, like uh, visiting, you know, the pyramids or watching, uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, other historical events, visiting the Louvre, like you, a kid can, all the kids can go into the virtual reality room in their school uh, and get to experience things and wander around, you know, uh, like standing on other planets in our solar system. It's a whole other level of education uh, uh, that this, you know, technology uh, makes possible. So for me, you know, I think it's, uh, uh, it's like all of our technology, it's like cell phones, you know, like uh, virtual reality is possible with most smartphones, you know, which almost everyone uh, uh, has. So I don't know. I, ho hey, I, I hope. Yeah. The, yeah. Hopefully, I we're going to we're going to keep the yeah. questions. You, Thank you. you. Uh, th th we have so many people who want to ask questions. So next question, please. Just want to say the premiere was fantastic. You absolutely inspired me and my enthusiast <laughs> friends um, <laughs> who have come from a background of being beat up in school for being the nerds that we were to thriving and being empowered. Um, we host now five monthly meetups where we bring VR to the masses. We're bringing VR to theaters for your premiere. You did such an amazing thing for the enthusiast community, and I just want to thank you oh, for thank all you. the work you do. I have my extra life. To oh, right here. on. Oh, thank you so much, um, man. Yeah, guys, uh, I want to know, for th those of us that are Uber nerds, do you have anything for those Gunters out there in the movie, maybe, that we should be looking for? Oh, my gosh. There's so much stuff hidden in this movie. I don't know if I'm aware of all of it. Like, Steven, <laughs> Steven mentioned last night, he was watching the fine... Like, the special effects guys were sneaking stuff in without telling him, and he would have to... Uh, usually references to his own movies, because he was, you know, he would... Uh, we would always have to... Uh, 
uh, fight with him uh, to reference his own stuff, so we would just do it and not tell him, uh, and then see if he caught it uh, before the movie was finished. Uh, but uh, the, you know, they've been doing some really cool uh, uh, ARG stuff. I haven't been involved in it, but uh, like I'm aware of it, and uh, uh, they've had a really you know uh, unique uh, marketing campaign. But when you find when you when the Blu-ray comes out, which I believe is going to happen maybe August or September, then there's going to be even more. Uh, stuff and a lot of the uh, we shot a lot of 360 experiences uh, on the set. Uh, I personally shot them. Uh, I, they would set up a 360 camera and then the crew would run and hide, and it would just be me hanging out in the up in the stacks. So you'll be able to visit all the sets and locations uh, uh, at the studio, uh, just loading them off the the Blu-ray. It's going to be really cool. But thank, thank you. you so much for that question. Thank you so much. Uh, you got it. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up now, uh, Ernie. I just want to say th it's been a dream to interview you. Oh, thank um, you so much. I really I enjoyed it. And, and this guy this guy created kind of the kids version of the Oasis, Roblox, which my daughter plays every night and I actually uh, uh, I, it's amazing. It's the kids version of the Oasis and uh, uh, whenever my whenever my daughter, she doesn't want allowance, she wants Robux so she can buy stuff in Roblox and I give them to her but she has to explain to me uh, you know, uh, why she wants the object or what she wants to buy and so I can it's research. Yeah, I tell her it's research for my next uh, uh, novel in the Ready Player One universe. So thank you. Okay. Well, the, the insight to just the way you think and what you've done, I think, has been amazingly satisfying for me and I believe for the whole audience. Thank, thank you, you guys. So you much. guys were a great audience. Thank you guys so much.